Uh, let's get started. So um, we've got quite a lot to get through. Uh, Apologise for it being early, but this having to be a fast-paced presentation. But um, there's kind of quite a lot of content in this. So in 2013, Microsoft are changing lots of things. So if you're a developer or you work in SharePoint Designer, you'll find that lots of the mechanisms that we use to make certain changes in SharePoint um, become different. Uh, and we'll look at that evolution uh, in the beginning. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm uh, an independent consultant, an MVP for the last few years. I have a long running relationship with a UK company called Content and Code. I act as their head of development there and we've got around 20 or 25 devs. Uh, and my role is helping everybody get ready for SharePoint 2013. I have a blog at sharepointnutsandbolts.com. You can find me on Twitter at Chris O underscore Brian. So uh, if we think about um, kind of the development landscape for certain tasks in SharePoint, if you were around in SharePoint 2007, you'll probably remember Camel. And uh, Camel was awesome. You know, it's this really weird mixture of uh, kind of XML and HTML markup. And you know, if ever you spoke to um, a .NET dev that came to SharePoint and had to work with Camel, uh, Camel was an abbreviation, of course, Collaborative Application Markup Language. Uh, and these .NET guys, they often had another abbreviation for it, which was WTF. <laughs> and uh, it was just this really weird development uh, framework. Um, and in SharePoint 2010, Microsoft decided to move on from this, and we moved to XSL. Now, XSL was OK. Um, I was quite comfortable with it. I'd spent my early years um, deep in XSL for various reasons. I remember writing a 1,200-line XSL style sheet one time. And you know, it's, it's OK if you've done a lot of it. But if not, it was probably quite challenging. Now, the current situation is that we still have XSL, of course, if you're in 2010 land, or you have one foot in it, like I think most of us will do. In 2013, we've now moved on again, and Microsoft have changed direction slightly. So instead of using XSL to kind of obtain the right HTML from various pieces, it's now JavaScript. And it's kind of a pain when Microsoft changed direction and we have to learn a new thing. But I think once you see how consistent the framework is applied and how powerful it is, uh, I hope you'll agree that it's, uh, it's an advance. Now, there's a terminology thing to, uh, to understand here. Uh, and you'll see this uh, in different places on MSDN, where I don't think Microsoft are 100% clear in their terms, but hopefully if I try and explain it. So you'll hear Microsoft talk about client-side rendering. And really, to me, this is the overall family of technologies um, where Microsoft are shifting the, uh, the development bit to the client side in JavaScript. Really, this could come under uh, the two subcategories of this. So you could talk about JS Link, and this really comes around because lots of things in SharePoint have a new property, and this property is called JS Link. And we use this to specify a link to a JavaScript file. And in this file, we'll specify uh, exactly how we want the output to appear. And this could be used in things like um, a certain list or a certain field, and we'll go on to explain exactly where JS Link is relevant. The other subcategory of client-side rendering is really around display templates. And display templates get used in various places. So uh, we'll see that those get used in the content search web part, uh, in the search hover panel, uh, and so on. And these are all scenarios that we're going to look at today. So the four key scenarios that we're looking at are changing the user interface of a SharePoint list, changing the user interface of a SharePoint field. So maybe we want to do some conditional formatting uh, or some specific behavior based on some conditions. Uh, and also, the content search web part, let's say that we're using that to get some items on a page, but we have to make sure that the HTML uh, gets output in a certain way. And finally, the search hover panel. And the search hover panel is really cool. You know, you can do quite a lot with that thing. Now, you're not really meant to be able to read all this. <laughs> but the idea is that this is me searching in Visual Studio uh, in the object browser for JS Link. And these are all the controls in SharePoint that have this new JS Link property. So really, you can see that it's something very prevalent in SharePoint, and we can use it to customize lots of pieces of the UI. So we can use it for lists and views. We can use it for fields and web parts, and, and lots of other interesting scenarios like content types. Now, this particular idea of using this new JS Link thing for a field 
So maybe in 2007 or 2010, maybe you developed custom field control. It was quite a complex task, but maybe what you had to do there was um, we had a certain behavior in edit mode, but in display mode, we had to do something else. Maybe in edit mode, we entered a postcode, but in display mode, we displayed a map or any kind of variant with that. Consider that custom field controls required a lot of code that was a farm solution. We can't do that kind of thing on Office 365. Office 365 is very important to Microsoft. So this approach is the new way of doing things. And all of the things that we're looking at today work in Office 365 and work on on-premises. Basically, Microsoft had to give us new tools uh, to be able to fulfill some of these tasks. <coughs> now, this doesn't mean a great deal to you at the moment. It's kind of a reference slide, but I wanted to show it before we get into JavaScript or any kind of code, uh, because really, lots of these um, approaches revolve around this, uh, this technique. So basically, when we work in JavaScript, Microsoft are providing us with an object. It's called render context. And it has some templates. And this is how uh, we are going to give SharePoint our custom HTML that we want things to be output as. So let's say I'm working in a list. Okay, The list has a templates collection, and it has header, item, and footer. So if I want my items to be output with a green background or something like that, then it's probably this one that I'm interested in. And basically, I need to uh, hook into that and supply my HTML, and then my list is going to uh, come out the way I want it. Now, we register these things when we're working with lists on three hooks. Okay? So we've got the base view ID, the list template type, and the control mode. So base view ID could be one for all items. It's three for Explorer view and so on. List template type, that would be the ID of the list if it's a custom list. You might be accustomed to uh, starting your IDs from 10,000 upwards, because that's the, the guidance there. And we've got things like a control mode in certain cases. That could be display, edit, and so on. And we've got various other uh, things that we can play with. So maybe we, we don't just want to supply a template. Maybe we want to uh, run some code before the list gets rendered. Maybe we want to tweak something. Or maybe we want to run some jQuery after it's rendered. And we're going to do something special there. And it's all these various hooks on the render context object model. Uh, that, so the render context object that we'll use. And these uh, list data and list schema ones, they can be used for quite advanced scenarios, so we'll come back to those later. OK, so uh, I think it's 10 past 9. I think it's time for some code. OK, so this is my developer VM. And the first scenario that I want to look at is changing the UI of a list. Now, if you read my blog, you might have seen this, but I just want to go over it because uh, I think it is a, a useful illustration. So this is a SharePoint list. And using JS Link, I have transformed the UI. So that effectively, I'm using um, jQuery UI's accordion. Now, I don't think you're ever going to do this in real life. I can't imagine a customer would ask you to do this. But it is an interesting illustration of the power of JavaScript and changing the UI of a SharePoint list. So uh, just to demonstrate, if I sort of add a new item. Then there's nothing kind of really weird about this list. It's just a regular list um, behind the scenes. And if we save that, then we should see that in sort of in display mode of the list, <laughs> <They're cute. laughs> <laughs> too kind, too kind. <laughs> then, you know, we've got a new list item. So, you know, probably you're not going to do this exact thing. But I think, you know, I'm a mechanism kind of guy. I want to understand um, exactly what the hooks are and exactly how I would use those to meet my client requirements. So I think that's why it's useful. Uh, and if we sort of take a look at what's necessary for this, um, basically I have a, a Visual Studio project. This is on my blog for download. And I do various things, like there's kind of a lot of scaffolding, like adding jQuery to pages. I'm using custom actions to do that, so that works in the cloud. Um, and you know, I've got lots of CSS, and that jQuery UI accordion comes with lots of images, so I need to add those to my site and so on. But really, 
the bulk of the work in the JavaScript template isn't that much. Thank you. So if we look into my JavaScript file, really what we see is this is my um, override context. Can you guys see that, or do I need to make that bigger? It's OK? OK. Um, so we can see that this is the, uh, the render context object model that I talked about. It has a template collection, and I can supply items to the header, item, and footer. Now, in this case, for the header, I'm specifying a div that has uh, an ID of accordion, because that's what the documentation says on the jQuery UI accordion. Um, and then for the footer, I just have a closing div. So I just need to wrap my, my list in that, that div. Now, for the item, I'm specifying uh, a custom function, and I've kind of got it all namespaced because I'm trying to be a good JavaScript developer and so on. Uh, and ultimately, that's this code down here. And really, all it does is uh, wrap the item title in a H3, and then the <laughs> item description in a div. Now, one thing that's interesting is that we have this kind of field on the context.current item. And basically, we'll have a property on the JavaScript object for each, um, each field in my list. And as we're developing this, we often have to know, OK, what is the, uh, the internal name of my field? How is this going to come through to my JavaScript? And what we can do, of course, if you're familiar with sort of debugging in JavaScript with some browser tool like uh, IE DevTools, then what we could do is find our function in our file. And we'll put a breakpoint there. Start debugging. And now what we should have is the debugger stopped on the right line. If I go to the watch area, sorry, the locals area, and go to context, current item, and there we'll see sort of all the properties of this JavaScript object. Now, this particular list item doesn't have many fields, so they don't really all appear here. If I had a wide list item with lots of custom columns, they'd appear here. I could pick up the right internal name from this, and then I can output it in my, my JavaScript. OK. And I do notice something weird. I think that's uh, just a, a thing from the debugger. Uh, I'm assuming that's going to. Uh, now, that's not my error, by the way. Uh, and I, I know you're not going to believe me, uh, but I promise you that's coming from one of Microsoft's internal files. Uh, yeah, and then if we reload the page, so I think that's just a, an artifact of the debugger. OK, so hopefully you can see that you know, that's an interesting technique. Um, you, know, you wouldn't use a, a UI accordion for that, but maybe you can think of some other um, examples that you might want to use. I was thinking that if I had more time, another scenario that's, um, again, completely not like a real-life customer scenario, but something that would be cool for this is um, I quite like coffee, and everybody in, around me in the company likes coffee. And I was thinking about one of those kind of coffee infographics, you know, where you've got nine cups across the bottom to say this and, and three going up, you know, all powered by a SharePoint list. And all you'd need is some JavaScript and CSS to do that, and uh, that would be quite a cool example as well. OK, so what we saw here, if you're thinking about the mechanisms, is that really I provisioned a custom list, and it was already hooked up to my JavaScript file. And the way I did that was, A, having the right JavaScript in here to register these templates, but B, I also, if we go into my, uh, my list definition, there's my items being provisioned as part of my list. What I have in here is um, somewhere, if I find it. Oh. Right, just here, this is where I have a property um, that basically is already pointing to my JavaScript file. Because I kind of need those two things. I need to point to the JavaScript file, and I need the right things in there. And so this means that whenever this list gets created, it's automatically going to have that rendering, automatically going to have that, that treatment. Now, what if I want some kind of display template, but I don't want to sort of bind it to a list at creation time? 
Maybe I want a template that I'm going to apply to any arbitrary list that already exists. Uh, so let's think about that scenario. So in this case, we're not going to use the JS link in schema XML because the list already exists and it's out there on the site and users using it. But what I want to do is I have my JavaScript file. How do I then associate that to my list? So we'll use a slightly different scenario. And in this case, uh, I have a, another fairly simple one. So it's a products list. Um, it's got some items in that I stole from Amazon. Uh, sorry, not stole from Amazon, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but basically, we've got some product names and some quantities. Now, let's say that I have, um, I have a template that I want to apply to this list. Now, bear with me a second. Let me... OK, so in this case, I have some PowerShell. Um, I'm guessing you can't read that, but you don't really need to. The key thing that we do here is get a reference to the list in this section. And what we do is we actually get a certain view of the list, which is the main view. And then we update its JS link property. Uh, so I'm using PowerShell to do this. You could use anything, you know, some server-side API code, some client-side API code if you needed to do it in the cloud. And all this would work. All we need to do is uh, put our J JavaScript file somewhere that can be accessed. So I think I have it in, um, I have this one in the layouts folder. I have other ones in the site assets library. Um, all we've got to do is put the JavaScript file somewhere accessible uh, and make sure that we can then update the list or the view uh, with its JS link property. So if I uh, just run my PowerShell file, I should be updating my list. Yeah, it's updated. And now if I go to my products list, OK, now I've just got some, some simple highlighting on a certain field. So this is conditional formatting, I guess. Um, and really, this is Microsoft's model for doing conditional formatting in 2013. So the idea of doing it in SharePoint Designer is out. Uh, and really, you're expected to do this the JavaScript way. Um, now, it's fairly simple JavaScript. So, so long as you've got your, um, your file associated, if we go to look at what that JavaScript file does, we'll see it's not too complex. So ultimately, um, it's very much the same as before. I'm working with my render context object. It's got a templates collection. In this case, uh, I'm working with fields. So we've got, got a fields collection. The one I'm uh, providing a custom rendering to is called sold. That's the name of the field on my list. And I'm pointing to a special function. And in there, I check the sold quantity. And if it's beneath a certain threshold, then I display a background of red. And you know, this is a very much a reusable template. You could imagine putting this in your site assets library, uh, may, maybe making people aware that, that it's, it's available. And we could um, point any arbitrary list to it. Of course, my threshold is hard coded in JavaScript at the moment. Maybe I'd want to do something better than that. Maybe I'd want to compare to another field on the list or something like that. But you can see that once you've got this JavaScript, and I don't think anybody ever sits down and writes that JavaScript without a good blog post or a good reference. Um, but once you've got it, it's very much a reusable thing. And that really is the conditional formatting way in 2013. OK, so just a couple of sort of quick little scenarios for um, customizing lists and, and fields and so on. Uh, but in terms of mechanisms, I think they are really important. And you can build a whole heap of scenarios on those. OK, so having thought about just the basic mechanisms then for hooking our JavaScript up to these things, just be aware of some kind of advanced tricks that could be useful sometimes. <laughs> so we mentioned that that object has this list data and list schema uh, property. And we can do quite cool things with these. So if we had our code execute on pre-render before the list has actually been output to the page, then we can do quite cool things with these. So let's say that we, um, we had five items in the list, 
and for some reason we need to go away and look up something else or, or check some other list or check some other system and we wanted to add a couple of items that aren't really in the list but we want them to render as if they are. Well, we can use the list data property for that. Maybe we want to kind of add a field on the end of our list that again doesn't really exist in terms of a, 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 a regular field on the, on the SharePoint list. But maybe we're going away and fetching some information from other system uh, or we're looking up something else and we want to add this field on the end and the user doesn't know when they look at the list that this is coming from somewhere else. Well, you can do that with the list schema property. So these are kind of advanced hooks where you can do uh, some cool things. And finally, we've got this idea of uh, another JavaScript object that Microsoft have, uh, and what this will allow you to do is kind of get the HTML uh, from a certain list or a certain view after it's been passed through the template, but you don't have to be in the context of a list. So maybe you're somewhere else, or you know, maybe you're in a timer job or, or something else that's a different part of SharePoint. Or perhaps more likely, maybe you're just in an Ajax method, and what you need to do is perhaps get this output, get this HTML for a certain list, and you're going to do something special in your jQuery and Ajax code, and really what you want is the ready-made HTML to drop into a div. You know, maybe you're doing something with, I don't know, jQuery UI tabs or, or something like that. And that thing will enable you to kind of push a certain list, even if it's not the real list data, you could push arbitrary data through there, and it will just give you the HTML and you can do what the hell you like with that. So, you know, lots of cool possibilities um, as you start to understand this framework more. Okay, uh, next big scenario then, uh, the content search web part. So we'll spend a little time talking about what this is because I think that not everybody understands um, where it's useful and its power. But, you know, obviously we're familiar with the content query web part and, and this kind of evolves with a new option uh, in 2013. So we'll, we'll look at kind of the basics of the content search web part for a while and then we'll move on to the display templates aspect of it. And how do we get this thing to render the exact HTML that maybe our designer or the client uh, is telling us that we need to achieve. So first of all, uh, let's just compare this to the content query web part that we know and love uh, from SharePoint 2010. And the first thing to say, of course, about the content search web part is the caveats that come with it are that you need an enterprise license. So the way that Microsoft have packaged things, content search is enterprise only. And that's if you're kind of on-premises, of course. So if you're in Office 365, unfortunately, this thing is not here yet. Now, uh, there's been lots of sort of articles written and so on. Oh, what a shame that the content search web part isn't in Office 365. Now, if I was a betting man, I would say <laughs> that this thing will be in Office 365 reasonably soon, okay? just so you're aware. So let's kind of compare these things just in terms of functionality and then we'll come back to the, uh, the JavaScript and the display templates aspect. So of course, a content query web part is query based. Um, so I'm really accessing the data in the database at that time. So it's always 100% up to date. In the content search web part, that's not the case. And really what we're asking for, what, what we're querying there is just the search index. And if our list has just been created or our author has just created a new page, then the likelihood is it's not in the search index yet and we have to wait for that content to be crawled. And that, of course, depends on how frequently we're crawling uh, and the crawl speeds that we're able to achieve. Often, it can be a matter of minutes, but this alone is a big decision factor when deciding which web part is suitable. Because if we're working in some situation where the authors or the editors are going to expect their new data or their edited data to show up immediately in this list of news articles or whatever it might be, then that's not the case with the content search web part. So that might drive us to stick with the good old content query web part. So that's a, a critical difference. In terms of scope, and this is where the content search web part really shows its power, of course, um, content query web part and the underlying SP site data query, that can only go within the current site collection. So if the requirement was to show news articles from across my entire set of SharePoint sites, I can't really use the content query web part for that. I can use the content search web part because search is the one thing in SharePoint that can see across all of the SharePoint sites 
and that's what makes it powerful. And that's why this, this new web part is important. In terms of styling, content query web part was XSLT, the content search web part is JavaScript. Uh, and I'd say that the content search web part has some other bonuses. Like we can do, uh, I guess the word for it would be parameterization. So if I want to show some articles that are related to the current user or the current user's department, then I can pass this into the content search web part without custom coding of any kind. And we'll look at some of the, uh, the flavors of that, um, that thing uh, later. Uh, also, we get some additional rendering from the content search web part. So it can do slideshows, it can do paging. And these were all things that we needed custom code for in the content query web part, and we don't with content search. So Microsoft have perhaps done more of that work for us. Now, just to think about some things that I think are really easy to deliver on uh, the content search web part. You know, so you think about these perhaps when we're designing intranets or clients are asking for certain requirements. So if ever you need to do like a more like this, that's easy. You know, maybe it's items matching a tag. Maybe the tag is whatever the current page is tagged with or the current area is tagged with. Recently changed items. So maybe I'm trying to find things that um, have been modified in the last week or the last day. Maybe I'm doing some news articles, something like that. Most popular items. Now this one is really interesting. Because Microsoft have kind of blended uh, search capabilities and web analytics capabilities into one, one section of SharePoint, search knows about which items are being clicked on the most. So if I wanted to show um, the most popular news items or the most popular items tagged with politics, I can do that. And you know, that's, that's really quite powerful. Maybe I want items you may be interested in. So that's that example of selecting something from the current user's profile. Maybe it's their, their interests or their skills. And maybe I want to combine this with you know, perhaps last modified date to have recent items uh, that you might be interested in. And finally, we've got lots of others, you know, items related to you. That could be where you're a, a contributor to the document or the site and so on. Uh, and those are all really easy things to achieve, just configuration only, no code. Now, it's important to understand that with the content search web part, because we're not going directly to the list or the pages libraries or document libraries, where these things come from is actually different. So if you think about a certain item, it's got a title, uh, this has some kind of abstract or, or description, has a last modified date, and it has an image. Well, all those aren't directly coming from my list items because we're not querying the list items directly. We're querying the search index. So where these actually come from is managed properties, if you know what they are. And really, a managed property allows me to map a certain, um, certain name to various types of fields. So as an example, let's say I could have a managed property that's called description. That could map to project description, task description, job description, uh, but they are all kind of being aggregated into this managed property that's just called description. Now that gets really powerful when you try and use one of these across lots of different types of data that might not all be on standardized content types, uh, but you kind of need something to come through for the title, something to come through for the description, and so on. Um, so it's good to start to understand these, uh, these mechanisms behind the, uh, the search. Now what we're really interested in today is uh, this idea of display templates. And it, when we go and look at the content search web part properties, you'll see there's an area for display templates. We get two drop downs. And really this is like uh, the template for the overall control and then the template for each item in the control. And that's really what we're going to play with. Now, the key thing is that these uh, items in this drop-down list that dictate how the items are going to be rendered, they are basically files in the master page gallery, JavaScript files. And that's basically what we're going to play with uh, to get some custom rendering. And one final uh, goodie to know about is the diagnostic item template. So this is one of those items in the list. And this thing is really powerful when uh, you know, I'm trying to understand why I'm not getting the right, the right um, properties coming back for my items. You know, I'm trying to look for a certain description and it's in a certain field and I'm trying to work out why it's not coming through. Uh, it's almost like you want to see what's directly in the search index. And SharePoint doesn't give us great tools for that. The nearest thing we've got is this display template. 
And it's just like a debugging tool for us people that are trying to hack solutions together. And what we get, <laughs> present, you know, present company accepted, of course. Um, and what we get really is a breakdown of exactly what it's got in each field. And then you might be able to see, ah, it's not job description I want, it's a role description. And then I can sort of tweak my settings to that, uh, and then I get the right output. OK, so let's look at some scenarios with the content search web part then. OK, so I'm going to go to uh, a publishing site. And I don't have anything on this page yet. But what we're going to do is add a content search web part and try and roll up some news articles. And then we're going to kind of try and get the right rendering for these news articles. OK, so it's a web part, of course. So we're going to insert web part. It's under content roll up. Go content search. OK, and actually straight away, it has found, yeah, thank you, Aldic. <laughs> it has found some articles. Um, and they've even got images coming through because I have some articles against my, my images. Now, I don't think the query's right because I've got an article called giraffe. Uh, and I don't think that's the right query. By the way, if you're ever testing search, you might have already thought about words like giraffe and zebra just do not tend to appear in content that authors create. So it's really good for testing things like search. Is my item, item being indexed and so on? Although if you work in a zoo or something, then uh, <laughs> yeah, you might need some different words. So I need to change my query. Uh, and over here in the uh, properties, I've got a big change query button. So we'll hit that. And here's where we see the power of the content search web part, this whole big new UI that helps me find the right items. And you probably can't see uh, like the low-level detail on this, but um, basically we've got lots of different sources where I can find certain things quite easily, items matching a content type. Uh, I could get pages. I could get, um, I think there's pictures there. And all the time, this kind of test area, this preview area is updating. So I, I get to find if I've got the right query without um, kind of coming out of here, saving the page, and so on. Now, I've also got this advanced mode. And here, I can really drill down and, and really get my query right. So I could select a certain property, and now I should have the big long list of all the managed properties that are known to SharePoint. Maybe I'm going to select uh, author contains a manual value of Chris. We'll add that property filter. And now you see that this text box is updated. And this is kind of the, uh, the internal query text that I can play around with if I, if I understand KQL, which is this. Uh, and then I can test my query, uh, and that's sort of filtered down, uh, and so on. So really powerful. Um, in this case, what I'm going to select is items that have been tagged with something. And I can do this in this quick mode. Um, so items matching a tag. I'm going to come down here and restrict on a tag. And the tag is SharePoint. Now I've just got a couple of items there, so let me pick the right one. SharePoint, <laughs> keywords, uh, and I'm just going to go to the test tab. Yeah, and now I'm down to three articles, and those are the ones that I want. So my query is, is now good. OK, so we'll come out of there, and I'm just going to apply that. OK, so that's fine. So I've now got the right articles. I've lost the images, um, but I think that's uh, really just a bug. And if I come out of here and save. Yeah, we find that there's my images. OK, so we're starting to get the right articles now. Um, but you know, all I've got is this image, and I've got a title, and maybe I want some more details. So uh, we'll go and deal with that now. And here's where we need to think about the managed properties and where my various pieces of information are coming from. OK, so what we're going to do is come down here to the property mappings area. And uh, if I just sort of make that up there, what we're going to say is that I'm going to change these from the defaults. And basically, for each of these uh, properties, I have uh, a drop down. 
And all I have to do is select the right properties. So if I say, uh, I know that I've got some description text in the byline property, and maybe I want to also show the last modified time of the article. If I apply those, okay, so you know, I'm starting to get more data through for my news articles and I'm starting to head in the right direction. Question. <laughs> That's exactly what these are. So the question is, uh, can you use slots like the content query web part? Yeah, it's exactly the same model. And in actual fact, I'm working with a template that has four slots. Right? It has image, title, uh, description, uh, sorry, image, title, line one, line two. Right? What you'll find is that if you, as you understand this framework more, I can have as many lines as I want, as many slots. It's just that the default display template that we're using, which is called uh, picture on left, three lines on right, that's the default that I'm selected at the moment. This one has four slots. If I want to create a custom display template that has 10 slots, then I can do that. Uh, and really, I just have to edit the JavaScript. And then in the web part properties, I now have a, a whole series more drop downs, and I just bind those to the right properties. Correct. I mean, you, I guess the, the thing to say is that you do need to edit the JavaScript because uh, really SharePoint is looking at that JavaScript file to understand how many slots are there, to understand how many drop downs to give you in the properties. As long as you've got the JavaScript right, then you'll get those, and it's just a question of using the drop downs. Okay, so we are starting to get to um, the right content at least. Uh, what we now need to think about is the rendering. So um, how do I use JavaScript to get the right rendering of this thing? I'm kind of in the default at the moment, uh, and I want to change that. So what we do is we come to the display templates area, and you can see that I've got two drop downs, one for the control and one for the item. And as I said, we, we're using this picture on left, three lines on the right. So several templates come with SharePoint. And um, basically, if I was to, to change this to a slideshow, you'll find that now I've kind of got this jQuery carousel thing, and it's going to cycle through my articles. Uh, and it does this all without, um, without much customization. Um, maybe I want some paging. I've only got three articles here, but I'd have paging controls up here if I had more than, uh, more than three. Uh, I'll just go back to list. And similarly, if I uh, wanted some different types of rendering, then I can get that. Um, and it's all really quite good. These are, these are quite nice templates that come with SharePoint. But they probably might not match what your designer or you know, somebody who's dictating what your look and feel should, should come out like. So maybe there's a need uh, to create some custom ones. So how do I get my custom template to appear in this dropdown? What's the process of creating that and then selecting it? Well, the answer is uh, the file needs to appear in the master page gallery. So let's go and create a custom display template for the content search web part. So I'm in uh, my site in SharePoint Designer, and I'm in the master page gallery. I'm in the display template subfolder, and in here, I have a folder called Content Web Parts, and these are all those uh, display templates. So you could go and you know you could modify the out-of-the-box ones if you want. If you're creating a new one, then the process is usually to um, to take a copy of one. And what you might notice is that for each template, I've got a HTML file and a JavaScript file. This only is the case in publishing sites. Okay, if I go to a team site and go to this um, this area then what you find is I only have the JavaScript files. And that's because this site does not have publishing activated. And this idea of having a JavaScript file and a HTML file <coughs> comes with um, the design manager capability of SharePoint 2013. And that's only for publishing sites. So really, it's a slightly different experience if I'm going to now play with these templates, depending on whether I'm in publishing or not. So, the whole point of having this HTML file and JavaScript file is that it becomes easier to work with than working with Microsoft JavaScript, which is slightly nasty. So if I was to show you one of their JavaScript files, you can see that uh, they've got quite a lot of, uh, they've got some scaffolding JavaScript. 
And then what they're doing here is they have a JavaScript array that they're pushing new strings to. And yeah, I could edit this HTML if you can sort of see that. I could edit this HTML, but it's a bit tricky because um, we're in this JavaScript array. So what they're doing is basically giving me a HTML file. So if I go into this one, then I actually have some JavaScript in here. It's in some HTML comments, but there's some guidance on how this file kind of works. Um, but down here, the actual HTML is a bit easier to work with. And the real advantage, of course, is that because this is just a HTML file, I could open this in Dreamweaver uh, or you know, Expression Blend or Expression Web, something that's got a design surface, and I could not have to work with the HTML directly. I could drag things along and add tables and add divs and use the design capabilities of that tool uh, and just save it back. Now, the way that they expect you to do that is to, use, uh, to map a drive to the master page gallery, and then you can open it with any editor you like, and it's really quite powerful. So what we'll do is we'll take a copy of um, the HTML file here. And I'm just going to rename this. Now, I don't have any cle clever names for this. I'm just going to put my initials after everything. And what we really need to do with this item at the bottom is change its title in the middle, because that's what appears in the drop down and I need to be able to recognize this thing. So I'm just going to put something in here. Thank you, SharePoint. OK, and now I have my HTML file. Now, you might be wondering, so how does what happens with the JavaScript file? And the answer is, it gets generated for me. So whenever I save this file, Microsoft have an event receiver on this list that automatically creates the right JavaScript file from my HTML file. Uh, and it's really quite clever. It happens really quickly. Um, and you'll see that you, know, it, you don't spend too much time waiting for it when you're working in SharePoint Designer. So this is my HTML. Uh, and I'm just going to come in and edit this. Uh, in actual fact, the change I need to make to get the right uh, HTML output is quite simple in my case. Uh, I've kind of uh, set things up so that all I need to do is add a CSS class. And because I have a CSS file on this site, hopefully my styling is then going to kick in. Now, uh, let's just see if that's the case. OK, so now what I really need to do is uh, just sort of refresh this page. So I'm just going to uh, select something and come out. So I now, I now need it to pick up the fact that that new file is there. Notice that I've lost my article byline and last modified date. I think that's a bug. Uh, and it gets really quite irritating when you're working with this web part. So we'll have to put those back. Um, maybe somebody can raise that with Microsoft. Uh, maybe I'll do that. But let's think about these uh, display templates. OK, and now uh, the web part knows that my file is in the master page gallery. Uh, so it's, uh, it's the top item in this drop down. I can select this. And there's my kind of rendering that I've got. Uh, and if we just put those property mappings back. No, not that one. And actually, you can type directly into this thing, which is kind of useful as well. You don't have to uh, select from the drop down. OK, and there's my articles. They're on the, um, the custom template that I've got. I've got this snazzy uh, CSS3 rendering uh, of the images and so on. Uh, and you know, maybe you'd really have better HTML or alternative HTML to this. Uh, but that's the, the basic idea of getting the right items and getting the, the right rendering. Now, what happens if you, know, you really needed to change the HTML more dramatically? You saw me only add a CSS class, and it was quite easy. Well, it's still the same thing. You just need to go into that file, change the HTML to be exactly what you want, and then as long as everything is in place, then you'll get the right output. So one thing to think about here. You've seen me work in SharePoint Designer. And maybe you're thinking that, um, OK, well, that's great. But you know, really, I'm a developer, and I work in features and solutions. And I want all this to, 
to kind of happen automatically so that this page gets created and um, you know, I've deployed my display template to the master page gallery, so that's already there. But I've also created a page with this web part pre-configured with the right query and pointing to the right display template. Um, you know, and maybe, maybe you've seen some of my talks before and you think, you know, great to do it in SharePoint Designer, Chris, but aren't you the, you know, the ALM guy who talks about continuous integration and automated builds and, you know, I'm not going to do this in SharePoint Designer. Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, so when I do this in Visual Studio and I basically uh, create all this stuff in solutions and features, and remember that there is an initial decision to, uh, to think about here if you're in a publishing site. So let's say I'm deploying this stuff with a feature. Which file do I deploy? The HTML or the JavaScript file? Well, the answer is, actually, I think you deploy the JavaScript file. So I've seen other people say you deploy the HTML file and then you need an event receiver to touch that file so that it causes the creation of the other one. I think that's nonsense, right? You only need this HTML file in dev. It's just to make your lives easier in dev. It's never used at runtime. It's never used in production. So in production, the only file you need is JavaScript. Okay? So by all means, use this HTML support if you want to in dev. Uh, but in terms of what you need to take forward to test and production and so on, it's only the, uh, the JavaScript file. So what I'm doing is deploying the Deploying the uh, JavaScript file there. I've got a new one called COB provisioned. It's got the, uh, the right sort of HTML in there. And let's just see if we can quickly show this. I'm just going to deploy this. So kind of what I'm hoping for is that my uh, display template get, goes to the master page gallery. My page uh, gets created in my, uh, in my pages library. And it's already got the right web part on there, pre-configured with the right query and the right display template. And what I've done to, uh, to kind of arrive at this is I've basically exported one of those web parts from the page. I get all this XML. It's got lots of properties uh, that look quite interesting, including like an item template ID. And that points to my custom JavaScript file. And that should be landing in the master page gallery and so on. Uh, and, you know, as far as I can see, it should all just work. But again, uh, there's something, unfortunately, which means that it doesn't. And I think it's a bug. Uh, I'm going to try and raise it with Microsoft. Uh, while we're waiting for that to spin up, if you're really interested and you're following this stuff, then basically, uh, with some sort of forensic level debugging session <laughs> that I did one time with Reflector Pro, uh, I find, and this is basically the internals of Microsoft's web part. Uh, you might know that Reflector Pro can um, sort of decompile these things and so on. Uh, basically, you find that Microsoft have hard-coded some defaults so that what you get is that uh, picture three lines template. It will select that under certain circumstances. And if that's now come back, we'll see that that's exactly what's happened, unfortunately. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be any way of deploying all this stuff as a feature uh, and it all to kick in nicely. So I've got my query, uh, but I haven't got my rendering. I haven't got my fancy uh, sort of image stuff. And when I go and edit the page, we think, okay, what's gone wrong? Is it that my, maybe my display template didn't land in the right place? And you know, maybe it's not going to be there in the dropdown. But it is there in the dropdown. It's the top item. And if I select it, you find that actually the rendering does kick in. So if I uh, just come out of here. You find that the template is fine as well. So I think that's just a bug. Uh, and I'm hoping they fix it, because for these sort of automated scenarios that we work with, uh, we're going to need that. OK, so just some sort of uh, some potentially useful information. Okay, now some reference slides here. We talked about those dynamic values that are really powerful. Uh, you can use things like user, page, site, and you can really use those to avoid custom code with the content search web part. Okay, final scenario then, uh, the search hover panel. So do you all know what the search hover panel is? OK, 
Okay, all right, lots of nods. So basically, uh, when I hover over items in my search result page, I get a really cool preview in SharePoint 2013. And if I've got Office Web Apps installed, I can see inside the document and so on. Now, let's think about customizing this. And maybe uh, for certain file types, we'll do some special work in that preview panel. Uh, and really, I'm kind of using a simple case. Um, you might have seen Victor's uh, talk yesterday. I'll, I'll sort of explain how they tie in. Now, lots of new concepts in SharePoint 2013 search. The important thing, really, is that if I want a display template for a certain item in search, I need something called a result type. And I can use that to, to basically do the mapping and say, hey, for this result type, maybe it's by file extension like docx, or maybe it's by something else like a content type, then I need you, SharePoint, to use my custom JavaScript file. And it's that relationship that's important. Now, the hover panel is made up of several things. Um, so we have a header, a body, and a footer. And as you start to work with this thing, you'll find several different JavaScript files uh, that each correspond to those things. Uh, and basically, they're all files in the master page gallery that you can go and you can go and copy. Uh, and that's exactly what we'll do. Now, something that you might want to do is add an item to the footer. And this is where various links happen. Uh, and if I want to provide some custom functionality and I want it to fit in, then maybe that's what I want to do. And that's the example uh, that we're going to show. OK, so uh, last demo. Let's have a look at the search panel. OK, so my scenario is that I've got some CAD files. And um, we kind of did this as a proof of concept for our clients. Uh, let me just find where those are. So, so I just want to show you that I've got some CAD files. And we've kind of generated some thumbnails for them. Now, we've not done the, this in some super clever way. Uh, we have basically um, just obtained some JPEGs or something like that that represent these files. And construction. And basically, they're just in um, a certain library. So here, I've got my CAD files. They're special files. They uh, end with a DGN um, file extension. And if I go and look at one of these list items, we find that right next to it, uh, I have basically the thumbnail URL against the properties. So there's nothing really clever going on in terms of automatic generation of this thumbnail. This is something that anybody could build. And if you've got some preview that you want to use, uh, then this is how you'd hook this stuff together. Now, the bit that we're interested in is this. So if I search for a certain word, then what we're going to get is a, a series of search results. And the hover panel is kind of empty for this, this type of file. Uh, and really what we want to do is provide something that uh, gives gives a, an indication of what this file is so that the person doesn't have to open each file uh, when they're trying to find the result they want. OK, so here are my results. Um, and if I hover over them, my hover panel is kind of empty. It's a bit compressed because I'm on the projector. Uh, but really, we've got those thumbnails. So how about trying to hook them up so that they come through in the search results? So what we're going to do is some editing in um, in SharePoint Designer. And I think actually what I might do is fall back to my ready-made one, because I noticed that time's getting on. So what we'll do is I'll show you the ready-made version, and I'll walk you through the code changes. OK, so this is a separate site collection. right? This is a separate search center where I've already done this work. Uh, I've created these display templates in, in the uh, SharePoint Designer. And over here, if I do the same search, OK, now, I think that's about to load. Just give these a second. Ah, OK, so I'm being prompted because I haven't authenticated there yet. And there are ways around this prompt, by the way, including typing the right password. Yeah. OK, so in this case, now you see that my my hover panel has uh, this preview, uh, and this result is starting to look a lot better. So, um, you know, I've kind of done it with the example of CAD files, and 
Uh, in fact, it might look better if I zoom out a bit, actually. So as I sort of hover over these CAD files, I get a different, um, a different preview, and that's basically the, uh, the, the thumbnail of this file. Uh, and this kind of stuff is really easy to achieve. So what I've needed to do is go into the master page gallery and create a certain template that knows how to find that thumbnail. It's just a property on the list item at the end of the day. So it's very easy to link the two together. And um, what we need to do in the search config is have a result type, which is in here. And the way I've linked my template is to say, OK, I've created a result type called CAD files. And when I go and see how I've hooked these things together, I've basically used the content type. So I've said, if the search page is showing any items with this long content type in this box that I've pasted in, then what I want to do is use a template for CAD files. And this template, as you might imagine from the other demo, is coming from the master page gallery, where what I've done is I've taken a copy of an existing one, and I've just tweaked the HTML a bit so that we're also adding a div with an image tag. And the URL, the source of that image tag, is basically coming from my, uh, my item, where I already had the two things next to each other. So there's not a lot of work. And you can see that I can provide a custom display template. I can choose the rule to associate it with. And it's, it's not really too complex. You know, I'll give you all these files and the instructions. Um, I'm using content type. But because in this, uh, this drop-down list up here of what the rule is hooked on, I can use basically anything. So I could use a custom display template if the articles were authored by the CEO or if they were created in the last week or if they were tagged with sport or politics. And the power of this stuff in, in search is, is really quite phenomenal. Um, so that's sort of my example of CAD files. Now, the other thing I did... Um, which is uh, something that hopefully I can show if I just have five here. OK, so I think we'll just go and try quickly try and build this one. So in search, what I want to do is we're going to edit this one. And I, I sort of wanted to extend this a bit more and think about, OK, so that's great. So we can do thumbnails and so on. But what about uh, perhaps doing some AJAX and some programming in the search hover panel? So what I did here is I added a custom, uh, a custom action in the footer. And let's just sort of hook this up now. I get the right thing. OK, so here's some HTML I'm just going to drop in. And I'm just going to drop this in to this file. And I've got one more to do. This one. And really, I wanted to play around with these sort of on post render functions. And the sort of scenario that I came up with is um, I wanted to sort of look at Ajax in that search results panel. And I wanted to perhaps think about the social capabilities of 2010. And if I do a search now, what we should see, I'm just going to control F5 that, is that I now have a, another item in my footer. And this item is called post. And this doesn't come with SharePoint out of the box. I've put that there. And I've put some JavaScript behind it with some Ajax. And if I hit that, uh, and it's, it's all kind of compressed because I'm on the projector, but normally that looks, uh, that kind of renders right. If I post, then I get this sort of UI that appears. Uh, I'll just do it in this one. Uh, and I can type a message here and say, I love this presentation. 
And what this is going to do, if it works, is I'm going to hit the post button. And, yep, that, I just moused off that. Where did that one go? OK, so I get this. Your post was published. So I'm kind of uh, putting up a, a little UI and then putting up a success message. And hopefully what that's done is posted that to my, uh, my followers in SharePoint. So this is my My Site page. And hopefully that's posted to my feed when this refreshes. Uh, and that's then going to be broadcast to all my followers. So it's just kind of a nice scenario uh, of playing around with um, you know, the social capabilities and the search panel and just hooking various pieces of SharePoint together um, and so on. So I'll give you all that JavaScript code. Uh, it's uh, perhaps a sample that you can use for something else. OK, uh, so I think we've just got one wrap-up slide and then we're done. Uh, so, so some lessons learned. It's quite, you know, there's a few things that you stumble across if you're trying to do that kind of customization with the search panel. Uh, lots of fun and games if you're doing jQuery, but once you've learned a couple of key lessons, it actually becomes easy. Uh, so I'll blog about this in more detail. Um, but I think in summary, you know, JavaScript is obviously the way that Microsoft intend us to customize the UI in SharePoint. We've looked at a few scenarios. So we've looked at customizing an entire list UI. Uh, using rendering of a special field, like in terms of conditional formatting. Uh, we looked at rendering the content search web part and getting custom HTML to be used for that. Uh, and finally, the search hover panel with some nifty Ajax and, and some interesting scenarios there. But there's lots of other possibilities, um, and I think you just agree that you know, we have to learn some of this JavaScript, we have to learn some of these new techniques, but you can achieve quite a lot in the product. Okay, thanks very much.